Hey everyone, D&D Detective here. Before we begin, I wanted to say this video was not sponsored by Cobalt Press, and I paid for this with my own money. So I wanted to review Cobalt Press's new Tome of Heroes book. It's a collection of new races, subclasses, spells, fates, backgrounds, and more, as well as some reprinted spells. There are around 70 new subclasses in the book, and around 140 spells, by my count, about 33 of the spells in here were in their earlier product, Deep Magic. If I had to compare the products, I'd say that Deep Magic is a book of spells, with subclasses and other content, while the Tomb of Heroes is a book of subclasses, with races, spells, and other content. About a third of the book is dedicated to subclasses. In this review, I'm going to be going through each section of the book and give my thoughts on each. I'll start though with races. The book has a mix of very safe and generic race options, as well as some really interesting options. They are designed under the old model for character races, so you will see languages and weapon proficiencies, and they all have fixed stat bonuses, but obviously, the book also points out that these are just typical stat bonuses for races, and that you should feel free to work with your DM to customize them. Some of the race options feel very safe, like the Alciad. They are meant to be cousins of centaurs, and in some ways, just feel like a better option compared to the official centaur race. There are enough mechanical differences between them that they do feel mechanically distinct. The race section of the book is full of different sub-race options that explore how a race differs in different parts of a given world. These allow the book to explore some of the different environments that these races can be found in. In the case of the drow, it also allows them to consider different roles in the drow society and provides alternative traits for the drow in these roles. I will note that drow subclasses here are tied to the lore of Cold Press's own settings, so some of the text here won't line up with the lore of the Forgotten Realms. They've also updated the Gearforged race as well, which people familiar with the Midgard setting will recognize. Overall, I'd say there's a mix of easy to understand and complex races, and I think they've done a solid job with them. So the book has around 70 subclasses, and features subclasses for every class except the Artificer, since the Artificer isn't in the system's reference document. I'm not going to cover all the classes here. Frankly, there are so many subclasses, uh, that could be a video all on its own. But there are some definite standout options here that I liked. One of my favorites is the Vermin Domain Cleric. It's just got this great element of thematic ridiculousness to it. The fact that you can get telepathy with vermin, and you can use your channel divinity to temporarily transform into vermin and move, just really provides a unique option for Cleric users. It's a fun option, and while some of the spells are a bit underwhelming, you do get spells like web and conjure animals that mean you're certainly no slouch. Druids get a lot of subclasses here that tie into the natural world. So there's an ash druid, a bee druid, a druid that's all about crystals, a sand druid, a plant druid, an ooze druid, and a wind druid. Most of them seemed like pretty solid druid options when I read through them. There's also some interesting subclass options for monks here. They do rely a lot on expending key, which monks already struggle with, but thankfully the book also includes a couple of feats and magic items that help with key. I also like the Spore Sorcerer, which has this great spore theme that ties nicely into their use of metamagic, and in fact, some of their metamagic abilities are actually really good. The book also has some interesting metamagic options that I think are worth checking out. The Warlock section also has a bunch of new patrons. A few of these are tied into things you'll encounter in the world, like ancient dragons and ancient forests, but most are pretty powerful beings, like Animal Lords and the Hunter of Darkness. The book also presents new invocations, many of which are connected to the patrons that are found here. This is not to say that you shouldn't expect to have to tweak some of the subclasses in here, the book definitely has some subclasses that I think might present some issues. 
The Barbarians, Path of the Booming Magnificence, and Path of the Herald, are too dependent on having good charisma to work well, particularly the Path of Booming Magnificence. The Circle of the Bees subclass is thematically great, but mechanically, I think it could have been stronger. It's a subclass that expects you to be making unarmed strikes, even though druids get access to shillelagh. I'm not sure the damage scales enough to justify you making unarmed strikes instead of casting spells, even with this extra poison damage, especially when official cantrips like primal savagery scale with your level. There are magic items and a spell in the book that help with unarmed strikes, but there's no guarantee you'll get access to the magic items in particular. It feels like a melee-focused subclass that lacks good defensibility before 6th level, and while you could use Blur before then, druids are very concentration-dependent, and this doesn't seem like a very effective idea. Several of the rogue subclasses in here are not very good. The Cat Burglar and the Smuggler are rogue subclasses that feel like they would work better as a background or a feat. You are really going to have to play into these roles to get much use out of what they're offering, which might not be suited for the right campaign. The benefits they give just feel way too situational. The Sapper also feels a bit weak as well. Their alchemical bomb has an interesting ability to create difficult terrain, but the damage it does is pretty weak. I would have rather have seen a limited number of uses, but for an amount of damage that made it worth it to use. I'd also add with the Sapper that while the book can't make this clear for copyright reasons, there's a section in the DMG that covers traps, which is what you can use if you're looking for what exactly a spike trap is and for what a locked pit is. The book also has a cleric variant of the arcane trickster called the Soul Spy. Its access to cleric cantrips and spells is great, but its issues are with its other abilities. One of its central third level features actually gets a diverse number of uses, but one use it has is for making ranged spell attacks. Unfortunately, this takes your action to do this, and it doesn't scale well because it requires the use of your wisdom for the attack roll, but doesn't give a damage bonus based on your wisdom. So a character using a longbow with, say, 18 dexterity is going to do nearly the same amount of damage on average while hitting more reliably, and that's before factoring in sneak attack. Speaking of which, you can't actually add sneak attack to the damage this does until 9th level. It's also the only feature they get at 9th level. So I guess it's an interesting concept for a subclass, but it definitely has some holes in its execution. Unfortunately, none of the sorcerer's subclasses here have the 10 bonus spells that we're starting to see with the new official sorcerer subclasses. So while mechanically they have some interesting and sometimes very useful features, they also do feel a bit bland. I wish they had just taken the leap and done this for this book, because subclasses like the Hungering have some cool features, but there isn't enough of a reason to get me to want to play one. The Corsair Wizard is basically a stealthy arcane archer that gets one great second level feature, and then several underwhelming features until 14th level. The problem is that its 6th level feature just doesn't do enough extra damage to justify using both your action and bonus action to use it, especially on a class with increasing access to powerful spells. I'd say in terms of originality and quality, they are definitely a step up from the subclasses in Deep Magic. You may find yourself needing to rebalance some of them, but I'm confident that someone buying this for the subclasses will find things they like. The book has a bunch of new backgrounds and feats, some proofreading issues aside, I think the backgrounds were well done. I particularly like the Servant's Invisibility feature. It's relevant enough that you can find a use for it, but it could also make for some funny encounters. I think you'll find pretty reasonable options here overall. As for the feats, the book has a small number of feats. Some of these are frankly on the weaker end, like the Floriographer and Forest Denizen. Even as half feats, they feel like they could have used a bit of a boost. The features of the Forest Denizen, in particular, feel very situational. Stunning Sniper 
also feels like it should have been a half feat. I do like the fact that the book has presented some feats to give additional key and sorcery points for those willing to take a half feat for it. These provide an option for players who might be looking to get more uses out of these class resources. Moving on to the adventuring gear section, the book has a ton of new options here. You could have a whole video covering them, frankly. Over 20 pages of the book are covering this, including new weapons, armor, tools, etc. There's even a section on vehicles and mounts, but expect some issues here. Some of the options here are fine, like you get a shield that gives you only a plus one AC bonus, but that leaves you with a free hand, not to mention a whole slew of new weapons to look through and some new weapon traits. But just like Wizards of the Coast pricing, expect some wonky costs in this section. Take, for instance, the handheld bombs that do 1d6 fire damage on a hit, but that costs 60 gold. Now they do have the gunpowder property, which means they'll do extra damage if you roll a 6 on that roll, but it's still not a lot. It's also an improvised weapon, which means that typically you won't have a proficiency bonus when throwing it. On a similar note, the Shashka sword is just a worse longsword. The only special trait it has is that you can't use it two-handed when mounted. Since you can do that with long swords, there's really no mechanical reason to use it. The worm silk whip and wrist knife are significantly more expensive than their regular whip and dagger counterparts, while giving no mechanical advantage. With the exception, I guess, that the knife does slashing damage instead of the dagger's piercing damage, but also doesn't have the throne property. The rules section is likewise a very diverse section of the book. It has content on everything, from how to deal with criminal enterprises and foraging, to running a manor, managing land, and running a trading company. If your party wants more downtime activities, you'll definitely find content in here covering a wide range of things. It also has group themes that can tie the party together. Like at the start of the adventure, you are imprisoned, so you get the benefits that stem from that. There are new weapon options as well that give the martial characters in your group something to do other than attack, but some of the material I would never use. I find the trade profit section to be a lot more involved than what I think my players would ever go for. It's like a small game all on its own. If you like the idea of this, and don't let me deter you, but I found it to be a bit too much, and would rather a simpler way of determining trade profit. Overall, I think most of the material in this section is interesting, and definitely the kind of thing you can at least read over and consider if you want to use it or not. Moving on to magic and spells, there are a few short sections in this book that cover draconic ruin magic and hedge magic, which is effectively plant magic. These do a good job of exploring alternative types of magic, but I'm going to be focusing here on spells. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are around 140 spells in the book. I would say, as far as the spells are concerned, most of them are fine. Some of them are interesting. A lot of them are decent spells that may be of use from time to time. Some of them are very niche, and a few are either underpowered or overpowered for their level. Overall, I found there are less issues with clarity or balance than with deep magic. I don't want to be null negative though, and in fact one of my favorite spells here is Force Reposition. There are a lot of utility and tactical uses this spell allows for, my favorite probably being that sorcerers get access to this, so you can subtle cast it and have the creature appear 60 feet up and immediately fall, all the while not knowing who did this to them, but by no means is this the only great spell in here. If you're looking to approve a spell here, take a look at the class spell list tables to see what classes they recommend for it. Druids and Bards, for instance, are concentration-dependent classes, so a spell just for them might be a bit too powerful on other classes. I'll post a link to a document in the video description that gives a breakdown of my thoughts on each spell in the book. If you do buy this, then be sure to check out any spell I've labeled as great in particular. Next up is magic items. There are 29 magic items in the book, and I'd say they are interesting. One of the cooler options is basically a set, 
where you get a permanent bonus if you are attuned to both items. But the book features several items here for monks that should be useful for their unarmed strikes or key. The other items in here vary a bit from useful bows to potions and other weapons. If you want a book for magic items, then Vault of Magic is the best way to go, but this section is just a welcome addition. Now let's talk about the artwork. I think the artwork in the book is a really solid. It does appear very pixelated, unfortunately. It would be nice if there was a higher resolution copy available from their website for download. Having said that, there is something about it I want to speak to, and that's that I want to credit Cobalt Press for taking the time to give descriptive text for the images in the book. I assume this was done to help the visually impaired, and I just think it's a nice little feature. Now let's talk about formatting. The formatting of this book is such a step up from Deep Magic. Everything is put into clear sections, like races, subclasses, spells, etc., and this works for the most part. One aspect of the book's formatting that could have been improved is that the subclass section doesn't say what class they're covering, so if you're just trying to make your way through the PDF without having to break out the bookmarks, it's just slightly less convenient than it could have been. Like this could have said, class options rogue, or something. It would have been more of an issue if you were using the physical product, I think. There's definitely a theme in the book of unarmed strikes. There are several races that provide them, four subclasses that revolve around them, and magical items and spells that improve them. But one problem in the book is that there's nowhere that's directing you towards these spells or items. There is this section for the pugilist fighter, but it doesn't cover everything, and it's found on page 88 of the book. I think this book could have benefited from having somewhere at the start that highlighted what spells and items complement unarmed strikes in the book. Otherwise, there are a few awkward choices that stick out that were probably necessary because of spacing, like how this information page is right in between a subclass's features. Now the information is thematic for the subclass, but the placement still feels a bit awkward. All of these are fairly minor issues, and a book that's organized very well. It doesn't have an index, but if a few of these issues I've highlighted were addressed, I think that would have been a lot less of an issue. Moving on to proofreading, the book is definitely a step in the right direction, but by no means is it perfect. Channel Divinity, Grass Not the Wind, doesn't say if it takes an action, bonus action, or reaction to use. The Legionary Fighter has no 10th level feature. The Pugilist Fighter could have been clearer about whether or not this replaces your default use of Second Wind, or is an addition to it. As you can see here, the expanded spells for these Warlock subclasses include several official spells and Cobalt Press's own spells. Even though Warlocks already get access to them, the way Warlocks work is they don't automatically know these spells but rather they're added to their spell lists. So they get added to this pool of spells they can choose from when they level up. The Destined, Former Adventurer, Mercenary Recruit, and Monstrous Adoptee are missing either a tool or language proficiency. The Occultist has one too many tool and language proficiencies. The Stunning Striker feat works on any ranged attack, including spells. This doesn't seem like what they are going for, given the restrictions on it. Bound Haze notes that if you upcast the spell, its duration is one minute, but it was already one minute. The back of the book mentions the spell Conjure Fireflies, but this seems to have been cut. So that covers that, and be sure to check out in the document any of the issues I found with clarity with the book's spells. Overall, I think this is a big step up from Deep Magic. Anyone who picks this up, I think, will find things they like even if further refinement may be required on your end to use some of it. Finally, I want to recognize everyone at Cobalt Press who came together to work on this and for just the fact that they are willing to coordinate so many playtesters. If you get the chance, be sure to check out the front of the book where all the playtesters are noted. It's an impressive list, and I'm sure it was a lot of work to get feedback in from them, but I think that's reflected in the product quality. So with that said, here's my final score. Alright, that's it for the video. As always, if you had thoughts about this product, be sure to let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.